whatever it takes. By the way, that live communion this Friday night uh, at our house, Moses is actually going to be there. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, I have a, a labradoodle named Moses. <laughs> whatever it takes. Praise God. I want to tell you a, about a story. There was a house one time that was filled with people because Jesus was there. And as he is teaching his disciples in this house, so many people heard that he was there. They came and they surrounded the house, and the house was was impenetrable, and he's in the living room, and he's teaching, and some scholars believe that this was actually Peter's house. He's teaching the disciples, and, the, and there's also Pharisees and religious leaders have come, and they're in the house, and other people are in the house, and they're outside the house, and there's four men who have a friend who's paralyzed, and he's laying on a mat, and they carry him to this house, and they see they can't get in, so they go by way of the steps, they go up onto the roof, they take the tiles off the roof, they lower him down in front of Jesus, um, and Jesus does some amazing things in that moment, and uh, the guy ends up getting healed, saved, and God gets glory. The end. Most of you have heard that story, and it's a great story, and I, I want to talk to you about several elements from that story today, but specifically, I want to pivot on, because pivot's a big word today, I'll just use it, I want to, I want to land on his four friends, the, the paralyzed man's four friends, that they did whatever it took to get this paralyzed man in front of Jesus. If you have a Bible, I want you to turn with me this morning to Luke chapter 5, verse 17, and we're going to go through this passage. I'm going to read it to you this time, and I'm just going to stop and pause and share some thoughts with you along the way. Is that, is that okay? You all good with that? All right. So glad to have Will and Mary kitchen with us this morning, the directors at Teen Challenge. Good to have you guys. Great ministry. Luke chapter 5, verse 17. One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. The Pharisees weren't there to just give some extra amens to Jesus' preaching. How many of you know that's true? They weren't there to go, at a boy, you go, God. They had come there to find out, to find fault with Jesus. They were looking for a reason to arrest him. They were looking for a reason to pull him off of the scene. And so... It says that they're there from every area. They've come out of the woodwork. They're trying to catch Jesus and trip him up. And, and, and Luke makes just a small statement, but the, the power of the Lord was there to heal. Very subtle, but very meaningful. You're going to see in a moment. Verse 18 says, some men, everybody say some men. Some men were carrying a paralyzed man on a map and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. And when they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. Some men. Mark tells us, the, the Gospel of Mark tells us a little clear that there were four, actually. Four men who were carrying him they brought him to this house, and they couldn't get in. The man on the mat is paralyzed, so he can't walk himself. And he is without Christ, as we're going to see shortly in this story. 
Do you know when you are without Christ, you are paralyzed? It could be fear. It could be anxiety. It could be lust. It could be greed. It could be pride. So many things can have people without Christ, and it paralyzes them. And this man is physically paralyzed, but he's also spiritually paralyzed. And so the four men are taking him, and they've brought him to this house, and and they they can't get in. It's like trying to get into crumble cookie. (laughs) I've yet to to be able to get in. I've, I've thought about going, and then I see somebody post, don't even try. You think Jesus was in there. (laughs) And I'm wondering what's the difference in Crumble Cookie and Christian Life Fellowship that people aren't surrounding the church. (laughs) There's something that these guys saw, and that was the solution that's only found in Christ. And they knew that they had to get this guy in front of Jesus. And they get to the house, and there's people all around it, and they can't get through them, can't go around them, can't go under, what's the the song, little limerick? They can't can't do it. So they say, we're going to make a way where there seems to be no way. I I got a picture. Can can we see that picture? Okay, so this is an ancient uh, home in Israel, and this is what the houses look like. So if you're wondering, how did they do that? Most houses had steps that led up to the roof, okay? So if you're thinking like they got on each other's shoulders and they, I don't know, they, they climbed the steps and they took this guy up the steps and they got up on the top. Uh, Matthew's version and Mark's version both say they, they dug a hole. They removed the tile. So, you know, unless you're thinking they had like pickaxes and they're smashing the roof and some scholars, uh, uh, many scholars believe that this is Peter's house. So you got to imagine There's a different perspective. In Matthew's version of this story, Matthew just says they brought the paralytic to him and Jesus healed him, and that's it. But the Gospel of Mark was dictated by Peter to Mark. And in the Gospel of Mark, it says that they tore a hole in the roof. (laughs) That's what Peter remembers. Yeah, I was sitting there and there's a hole in my roof. They, they get to this house, and they can't get in, and some people may have gotten to that point and said to themselves, well, if God wanted him to be healed today, he would have made a way. There wouldn't be all these people here. And instead, these men are determined. Everybody say determined. So they go up on the roof. They're like, well, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm imagining these are the kind of guys that don't drive Priuses. They're like they're carrying their friend. They brought him here. If you drive one, I'm sorry. But anyway, they get him there. These are guys, and they're, they're like, hey, look, we got him this far. We're taking him up. We're, we're getting in this building somehow. And they, they carry him up, and they're like, we ain't going back either. We, you're walking home. <laughs> they let him down through the roof. Because Jesus was the answer. And they knew that. And if they could just get this man in front of Jesus. And God is saying, if you can just get the lost in front of me. You say, well, it's not my job. It's the Holy Spirit's job. But I want you, you're going to see here in a moment what God has to think about your job as part of this, being one of the four men. Well, the house is surrounded. I don't think we can get in. That's kind of, you know, so we're, we've started this initiative a couple years ago with Bless Every Home and reaching our neighborhoods and, and reaching the people around us in our workplaces and in our schools. And it's kind of like, Walking down the street and your prayer walking, you're saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to talk to so-and-so 
if they're out in the yard today. Some of you are giggling. You know what I'm talking about. You're walking, and then you see them out in the yard, and you're like, so then you change your mind. Well, Lord, if they say hi to me, then I'll, then I'll talk to them. And you get a little closer, and they say, hey. And then you say to yourself, well, if they bring up God, and then they don't bring up God, and you go, well, it must not have been today. That's kind of like this moment here. They had, a, they had a decision to make, and they said, no, no, no. We are not going to be di- dissuaded. We're not going to turn around. We're not going back, because the only solution for this paralyzed man is to get him in front of Jesus. This is the only solution. Church, the only solution for your friends who are paralyzed in sin is to get them in front of Jesus. You can't save them, but you can be a part of their salvation. That's good. So these guys don't make any excuses. We see here in verse 20, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. In Mark's gospel, Mark mentions the word faith four times. And when he mentions the word faith, it's never something you fall back on. It's always used in terms of an action. And what did Jesus see here of these four men? It says he saw their faith. What did he see? He saw their determination. He saw their grit. He saw that they weren't going to give up. He saw that even he knew that the house was surrounded. And he knew that these men, despite that there wasn't a door, they made a door. It says that he saw their faith. Your fr- friend, your sins are forgiven. What keeps us from getting people before Jesus? What keeps us from having conversations with people about Christ? What keeps us from sending people video links to a message or to a uh, uh, an app uh, that, that can send them a devotional or, or an idea or, or, or buying a book for them. What keeps us from that? Well, sometimes we don't talk to people about the Lord because we're afraid of what other people will say. We're afraid of the crowd that's around them. Think about when you're in school and your friends and you're thinking, I'm going to talk to that. I'm going to share Jesus with that person today. They're by their locker when I walk by. And you go by, they still have lockers in school? No, they don't do that anymore? You did away with lockers? Well, you guys are missing an opportunity. <laughs> if I see them in the cafeteria, they have cafeterias, right? See them in the cafeteria. I know they do, the food's bad. If I see them in the cafeteria, I'm going to say something to them. What would keep you if a bunch of their unsafe friends are around them? You'll go, hmm, maybe not. If you, if you walk into your office at work and you're gonna, you, you feel compelled to, to say something to somebody about what they're going through and that Jesus is the answer to their problem, but you see they're surrounded by a bunch of their unsafe friends, you're like, oh, yeah, today's not the day. The crowd, the crowd will keep us from bringing people before Jesus. But Jesus saw these guys. They were roof busters. You need some roof busting friends. And you need to be a roof busting friend yourself. More importantly, in my message today, I want you to hear that. You need to be a roof. Turn turn to the person next to you and say, be a roof buster. Now, if you're going to go busting somebody's roof, you better make sure Jesus is in the house. <laughs> and, and I mean in, in your house, okay? 
Pastor, I don't know how to do that. I don't, you know what? I know you don't. That's why, before you came in, I, I did something real simple for you. There were some cards on your chair when you came in. Did you see them? Did you just sit on them? Did you even notice them? Okay, there's some cards on your chair. They're just invitation cards. I, I want to tell you about some of the lowest hanging fruit possibly in front of you, which is Easter Sunday coming up next week. And most people, whether they're Christians or not, they even give acknowledgement somewhat to Easter. And they even think about maybe coming to church on Easter. In a little while, I'm going to ask you to, to pray about, a, to see it. maybe you already see them, a person's face, a person's name. And, and we're going to pray for them. And it, this week, at some point, you're going to just give them a card and invite them. Okay? This is low-hanging fruit, church. This is one way you can get people in front of Jesus. And if you've been participating with our Bless Every Home initiative, you can go to our website, and we have a link under Bless Every Home that has all kinds of ideas for things that you can do to engage lost people. Just ways to start having conversations, ways to start building relationships, ways that look and manifest in you grabbing the corner of their mat and helping to bring them in front of Jesus. That's what it equates to. You know, Jesus sees their determination. God honors us. He honors the person who is engaged in helping others to find Christ. Jesus sees what you're doing when you're doing that. When he sees that nothing's going to deter me from, from getting in this person's life and giving them truth, helping them to come and, and be present before God. Again, you don't save them, you can't save them, but you are certainly a part of the process. I, I'm so glad for a guy who I haven't talked to for over 20 years, just lost track of him, who called me out one day and just told me about my, my life and that I needed to change and, and, and told me how I needed to change it and that he was praying for me. I just, I, that spoke to me, and, and I was so convicted every time I would think about doing something that I knew I wasn't supposed to, and eventually led me to Christ. He was a part of that. And there were other people who were parts of it, people who had corners of the mat that I was laying on, who helped to bring me before Jesus. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Wait, what? Your sins are forgiven? And I'm sure that his friends were like, you know, they're probably sweating now. They've carried this guy. They, they tore the roof off. Talk about raising the roof. They took the roof off. They lowered this guy down. And now they're, they're probably up there like, Phew. And And then Jesus goes, your sins are forgiven. They're like, hey. Could you touch his legs? <laughs> I'm sure one of them's like, what did he say? <laughs> Your sins are forgiven? Well, that's good, but how about, the, how about his legs? <laughs> how about those legs? They don't need those. If you're a Lord of the Rings fan, you know that statement. Your sins are forgiven. You know, God knows what your lost friends need. God knows what you need, and, and maybe you've prayed a prayer, and God answered it a different way, and you're still waiting for the answer that you wanted, but God knows what you need. And so, a hundred times out of a hundred times, it's better to have a healthy spiritual life than a healthy physical life. Because 
You can have a healthy physical life without Christ and spend eternity separated from him. And you can have a healthy spiritual life and spend eternity with him and then have a healthy new resurrected body as well. And in this moment, Jesus recognizes what's most important, that this guy is paralyzed by sin in his life that he is not repented of and he doesn't have forgiveness from. And so Jesus deals with the most important thing first, and he says, your sins are forgiven. Then in Luke 5, 21, it says, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? I want you to stop for a second. Jesus knows what they're thinking. They weren't saying it. They were thinking it. Jesus knows what you're thinking. You're not saying it, but you're thinking it. And he knows it. That's why it's so important that you renew your mind with the word of God. You take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You just don't let thoughts run through your mind unfiltered and uncontrolled. God's given you the ability to take those things captive. And he's given us the word of God to renew and give us a new mind. And it, Jesus says, which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So the, he says to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. This was a, an amazing moment. And I love just how Jesus does stuff. What looked like was, this is, this is going to be bad. Jesus takes this whole moment and turns it around to the glory of God. The Pharisees are there, and they're watching, and they're waiting for him to mess up, and Jesus knows they're waiting for him to mess up, and, but Jesus cares more about this guy than he cares about them, and he says, your sins are forgiven. And they're like, he can't do that because their whole question of Jesus was, by what authority do you do these things? And Jesus says, by my Father in heaven. And they said, you're a blasphemer. So they're looking for him to mess up. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. They're going, aha, in their mind, aha, you can't do that. And Jesus is like, I heard that, your thoughts. And he goes, which is easier for me to do that because I have the power to, because if I have the power to forgive sins, then I would have to have the power to heal this guy too, right? He says, but it's easier. Here's why. You can say your sins are forgiven, but nobody ever sees that. It's invisible. Your sins are forgiven. I think, yes. You can't see it. That's why Jesus took the hard road. He said, it's easier to say that, but let me show you that the power of God is with me. And he says to the guy, stand up. Take your mat and go home. And in this moment, the strength of Jesus' words to obey manifest. The power... <clears throat> To respond in obedience to God comes from his word. And when his, his word that he's given us, when his word is spoken to us, when his word is read, when we've heard his word, there also comes the power behind it to help you fulfill it. It sure is quiet in this Episcopal church today. I came from one of those, and I know exactly what it's like. I'm just teasing you.
I want you to notice something that Jesus does here. He doesn't remove the responsibility from the paralyzed man. Now, if I can, just for a moment, talk about the paralyzed man. Because you're going to be reaching your goal this week and every week from here on until you die is to seek and save the lost. And you need to know something about the lost that you're seeking and saving, that they're paralyzed in sin. Like you once were, they are still. But when you speak the word to them, when you share the word with them, the power of God to save them, the power of God to restore them, the power of God to redeem them, all, and the power of God to minister to their brokenness is available in that moment, but it's up to them to stand up. That takes the pressure off of us. I am just the vessel, he's the savior. I just speak on his behalf, it's up to him to perform his word. So I share with others the gospel, the good news, that there is one who saves, the one who says that you can get up off of this mat. And notice that Jesus doesn't stand up and say, hey, give me your hand, I'm gonna pull you up, and here, here's your mat. No, he says to the guy, stand up and take your mat and go home. Now it's on that guy. And I want you to think about that guy for a moment because as you're sharing your faith with people this week and every week from now on until you die, just to be clear about that, this isn't a one-time thing. This isn't just a pre-Easter thing. This is an everything thing. This is an everyday thing. I don't live for Christ just the week before Easter. Okay? I want you to think about this man for just a moment. I want you to put yourself in his shoes because he's not in a really good spot right now. Okay? There are people in this room particularly the homeowner, who are not real happy with him. There are people outside who aren't happy because he cut line. There are people inside because he, he broke in in the middle of the message and Jesus stopped preaching. He's like, oh, you interrupted the message, dude. So there are people that are like, oh, everybody's going to catch you, wait your turn, you got to come through the roof. And then there's a the guy who's like, this is my roof, you would do it on our roof. And then you've got the Pharisees and the spiritual leaders who are over there. And I want you to hear this clearly. There are people in that room, those leaders, who did not want him to get up and be healed. Think about that. There are people who don't want the manifestation of God in their friends' lives because now they'll have to be convicted about their own sin. Oh. And so here's this man in the middle of this lion's den, and Jesus says to him, stand up and walk. And he's like, oh, gosh. I mean, I don't know what was going through his mind. He was probably, he was probably elated, like, yes, I'm out of here. But it says he, he gets up, grabs his mat, and goes home praising God. Praising God. So as a friend, you can bring people to Christ, and you can bring them, like it says they put them, every, every God, both Mark and Luke says that they dropped him right in front of Jesus. Very key phrase, right in front of Jesus. Don't bring people to something like Jesus. Don't bring people kind of around the church, but not to Jesus. Don't bring them right in front of Jesus. <laughs> what are we willing to do to bring people right in front of Jesus. How, how creative could you be? I mean, digging a hole through a roof is pretty creative. The Bible says about the disciples of Jesus that these were the men who turned the world upside down. And they didn't have fancy apps, and they didn't have websites, and they didn't have digital media. These guys just got creative out of necessity. 
Because they knew the truth, and they knew the truth that unless people get put in front of Jesus, they will continue to be paralyzed in their sin. And that Jesus is the only hope. And they were willing to not only believe that, but they died for it. Every disciple died except John. And they tried to kill John. They put him in a boiling vat of oil, and the Lord protected him. Ask God to give you some creative ways to to reach your friends. I, I want you to take that card out right now. Wherever it's at, find it. Steal one from your neighbor. If, they, if they're holding it loosely, take it, take it out of their hand. I want you to want it more than them. All right. Now, I want to be serious for just a minute. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to picture somebody's face. you to begin to intercede and pray for their salvation. Jesus, you desire that none are lost, but that all would be saved. And Lord, this this card represents a person person who's paralyzed in their sin and I pray for them today I want you to just speak their name let the Lord hear it in, from your lips to his ears I pray for this person today, Jesus and I'm asking God for a divine appointment, I'm asking for, for a divine opportunity to be able to begin the dialogue, begin a conversation. Lord, let me be one of those men Who has the corner of their mat? Give me determination this week, Lord. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes, thank you, Lord. Verse 25, it says, immediately he stood up in front of them. This is the paralyzed man. And he took what he'd been lying on and went home praising God. And everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. And they were filled with awe and they said, we've seen remarkable things today. You know, it's interesting that the faith of his friends got him there, got him saved. (laughs) But it was the resistance of his enemies that got him healed. And just want to speak that to someone here today that there's, there's a struggle, a resistance maybe in your life and you need to realize that if, if Jesus is first place in your life, then He's, he knows exactly what you're facing. He's not unaware. And he's going to use it for his glory. Whatever it is, he's going to use this for his glory. And this man stood up and in the middle 
of a lion's den, I, I perceive. You know, there are some people probably in this room right now who you've been, maybe this is your first time here, your first time being exposed to this teaching. I want to share something with you. Jesus said in the book of John, he said, I am the door. Speaking of doors, he said, I am the door and that no one can come into eternity with the Father except through me. Very bold statement. You think, well, all, don't all religions lead to, to heaven? No, they don't. Jesus said, I am the only way. And every religion believes that their way is the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you can't get to heaven except through me, the door. And so if you're new to hearing that here today, that Jesus forgives sins, that's good news for you. Because he died to forgive your sins. And we're going to celebrate his resurrection next week because he conquered death. And so if you're hearing that for the first time here today and you're like, I... I didn't know that, but I have sins and I need to be forgiven from. And I, I need to put my life into Jesus' hands. I don't want to be paralyzed by my sin anymore. You, you may be here and you've been coming here for weeks or months. Some of you may be sitting here today and you've been here for years. And you still have not bowed your knee to Jesus. I'm going to ask you to do something here in the last minute before we close the service. I'm going to ask you to have the same boldness that this man did. That he was obedient when Jesus said, stand up. His standing up was more than just an action. It was a step of faith saying, I believe you are who you say you are. If you're ready to make that decision for Christ today, I'm going to count to three, and on the count of three, I want you to have enough boldness to obey the Word of God and stand up with me. One, two, three. I want you to just stay standing for a second, okay? And I want us to pray a prayer together, all of us who are here. And this prayer is, um, well, it's the beginning of a relationship with you and God. And it's real simple. It goes like this. Jesus, everybody say it. I give you my life. Say it again. Jesus, I give you my life. Forgive me of my sins. I'm in need of a Savior. And I believe that you are it. I choose today to follow you with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand up together. One more thing, church. I've told you this before, that we are not a spectator sport here. This is a church of participation. And if there was somebody around you that you know that stood up and prayed that prayer, then you have the boldness before they leave just to touch base with them and say, hey, I just want to congratulate you on that. How can I help you? Right? We want to be a part of the disciple-making process. Amen? Is that a big amen? Yeah. All right. Okay, Easter's coming. You got your invitation cards? All right. On the count of three, we're going to shout and go out, and then you know exactly what you're going to do. Here we go. One, two, three. Lead someone to life. Let's go do it.